Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range U.S.-focused forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. We begin first by a map that was made by Brian Brett Schneider here. He's from Alaska. He's one of my favorite follows on Twitter. There's his Twitter handle down there. And the map that he made here shows you the number of daylight hours we're going to have on the summer solstice, which is tomorrow, June 20th. Now, sometimes it falls on the 20th, 21st, or 22nd here, and that's just a result of the way our calendar system is set up. But one thing that is for sure, the northern part of the United States here, we typically get around 16 to 16 and a half hours of daylight on this day, whereas getting down there in the southern U.S., I'm talking about Texas and, and, and Florida, it's about 14 hours of daylight. And normally we're taking full advantage of these longer days, but this year with the delays we've had in planting, well, you can see what's going on right here. This is just north and west of Indianapolis, uh, near a town called Crawfordsville. And what you're looking at here, Michael Klein posted this on Twitter for us all to take a look at here. Great Twitter handle, by the way, Michael, uh, Precision Nerd. Uh, he's showing us uh, previous years, how tall the crop was at this time in June and where it stands right now. And it's just amazing to see how delayed things are. Now, where that particular picture was taken was, again, was about right in through here, all right? If we just look over the last 15 days at total accumulated precipitation, or 14 days, sorry, we can see that that has been a part of the Corn Belt that's been absolutely slammed, stretching there from parts of, of western Pennsylvania, but through Ohio, southern half of Indiana, most of Kentucky here, extremely wet, and that carries over into southern Illinois as well. And it's not to say places outside of there haven't been wet, but for some of those locations, just in the last 14 days, they've picked up nearly a quarter of their annual rainfall. Remember, too, parts of the southeast, which were very, very dry up until recently, uh, have picked up a lot of rainfall as well, especially right there along the Appalachian Mountains. And then getting right down here along the coast of North and South Carolina where they needed the rain. Same thing for Florida. A lot of thunderstorm activity. And the Gulf of Mexico, which has been wide open, well, you can see right there along the Gulf Coast, a lot of precip. There are a few places that have been drier, like this section of Iowa stretching back into uh, parts of, of South Dakota and North Dakota. When I say drier, it's still rained, but it's drier than, I guess, compared to the rest of the country, at least east of the Rocky Mountains. We have been dry in the Canadian prairies, but that has been changing. So there is a drought situation setting up in northern Montana, northern North Dakota, and then in the Canadian prairies. But if you're watching this video from those locations, well, I've got some good news for you, at least in the near term here. Now, just to show you the, le the next 60 hours of precip, so this gets us out to midday on Friday. That place where that picture was taken, well, we're going to continue to see heavy rainfall into this area. And all of this is coming in uh, with thunderstorms, so this will be uh, some stronger thunderstorm activity in here as well. So uh, hit or miss, but regions in there are potentially picking up another two to three inches of rainfall from the complex of storms that's coming through again over the next couple of days and then over the weekend. Uh, outside of that, we are going to be watching for a trough to develop here, and that will help with the precipitation you see in parts of North and South Dakota and getting up into parts of Alberta, into Saskatchewan, and also into southern Manitoba. In fact, Alberta just yesterday had some huge thunderstorms, very picturesque, but uh, but large to say the least. So that's just looking at your next 60 hours, and you can see that because of that heavy rain that's forecast in that same region that has had so much rainfall lately, we've got a large section of the eastern Corn Belt here under flood watches, okay? Now as we progress forward, I'm gonna just give you the next week. We can see over on the left, this is the op operational European model, the zero Z run, uh, compared to the GFS. Now they both have heavier precip in this area, so you can kind of see some agreement there. But there's a bit of a difference uh, when we look out over the next week as to where the heaviest precip will be across, let's call this the, you know, the eastern two-thirds of the Corn Belt. What I'm talking about is you can see in both models it's going to rain. The GFS is wetter. The European model is really honing in on this higher atmospheric pressure just off the east coast, pumping quite a bit of moisture right up into this corridor. And it's not to say that it's not there in the GFS. It's just much wetter in the Euro. Uh, all along the Gulf Coast, we're just going to have repeated day after day of risk of showers and thunderstorms and multiple systems moving through the Corn Belt, keeping the next week wet. But the story, and this is a long-range forecast video, is about week two. We did see one run last night from the uh, uh, GFS model that came in with a really dry bias for this area, but then it corrected itself with the latest runs. So let's just take a look here at week two. This is only week two precipitation anomalies from the ECMWF over here on the left 
and the GFS over here on the right. We can see that both of them are trying to keep this particular section near average on precip or slightly wetter. We can see drier bias in the models in through here. The, um, the European model is wet in the Carolinas, uh, whereas the GFS does not, so a little bit different there. Uh, between the two models, but maybe a region right in through here where I've just kind of drawn the line on both images where we could be seeing slightly below average precipitation. Now, I, I say that, but remember, there will be a lot of thunderstorms. There's a lot of moisture to recycle, and I don't think these models have picked up very well on that particular aspect of the th uh, summer thunderstorm mode of, of, of convection, of, of raining. Uh, so even though you see that the slight dry bias in week two, so this leads up to like the 4th of July is what I'm talking about here. Um, this isn't like a, a, this isn't a dry pattern. Not, not, this isn't dry because of how much moisture we've got going on right now. Okay, so we got to diagnose that and really try to understand it. What will we be seeing over the next five days? Well, as a trough kind of settles in here out west, we will be seeing heat building in this area. So these temperatures here are on the uptick. Uh, where I just uh, kind of drew those lines. So warming trend there, getting into some triple digit heat in parts of Texas. Meanwhile, the Pacific Northwest, the high plains, and the north central plains, uh, kind of getting a bit of a cooler bias. When you get this out into the six to 10 day time period, the pattern before we build in this, this sizable ridge will keep things slightly cooler than average here. Now this isn't cold, but a slight cool bias with warmth kind of all around it in this area. About the only place still hanging under that cooler bias will be here in parts of the Pacific Northwest. California, let's to kind of hone in on you for a moment. While you still have a few more hot days coming up, things do subside into week two here with our forecast. But look out here uh, as we get out to the 11 to 15 day time period. We are gonna be keeping a big section of the Northern Plains on the warmer side of things, but with near average temperatures kind of tucked into here and a slight cool bias in through this area. And we got to talk about why that is, why that's showing up uh, in the forecast here. We're gonna get to it in just a few seconds, but that's your 11 to 15 day forecast. Now we need heat. A lot of folks didn't even get planted across the Corn Belt until June. And so this looks at the last 18 days of June here in terms of temperature anomalies. And unlike a year ago where we were having these warm nights and very warm days, uh, we've not had that. And I'll show you at the end of this video what our current growing degree day anomalies look like from the start of June here. But I bet you can get a pretty good idea. The heat out west, yeah, they've caught up. In the northwest, very, very warm, even though they're going into a cooler time period. But across much of the Corn Belt here, uh, things have been on, on the cooler side and therefore not picking up the heat like we want to. So let's get into this, the flow of the atmosphere, and try to understand where we're going, not just now, but through the month of July. I've got the day five pattern up for you here. So this is on the 24th, valid on the 24th here. And we can see overall we have this ridge kind of building into the Gulf uh, of Alaska here, really into the Aleutian Islands, and then a broad trough feature in through this area. Now this is why the European model is bringing in all that moisture in through this area. Remember, it's between troughs and ridges right in through here that we get our heaviest precip. And these systems are gonna start in that area just circled and move east with time under that ridge. But I told you the temperature's rebounding. This is what happens uh, by day 10 sorry, by day 10. We see our trough kind of moves back west and a big ridge builds in through this corridor. So this is going to be the surge of heat, uh, warmer than average, I should say. Not this isn't going to get super hot, but some warmer than average temperatures coming in toward the end of the month. Again, this is valid out here on the 29th of June. So the end of the month of June is building into this pattern. And this is where we really have to start looking at things closely. Because what's helping control this pattern is it's kind of a little bit off the image here, but you see this ridge pushing into Alaska here? That feature plus the trough that's just off the Aleutian Islands are the dominant players. Now look what happens as it gets you out to July the 4th here. That ridge is still evident here. There's our trough here, and we have some uh, trough sitting right here in the kind of over the, the Canadian um, ar archipelago here between uh, northern Canada and, and, and Greenland. Now because of that, because of the position of this, we are actually seeing the flow of the atmosphere. So watch it with me here. Splitting over the west, but following a path just like that. There's the split over the west and doing this. So our main ridge axis seems to be stuck here. In fact, I should have drawn that as a dashed or a, a squiggly line like that. And overall, even though you see higher heights in this area, there's actually a broader trough feature in there. So this means that that ridge is moving back to the west. And this is why I'm saying, even though the week two forecasts show that we're having a drier time period, they're not picking up on the convection. Because if the ridge sits right here in this area, 
We get northwest flow across the Corn Belt, and that's one that we tend to get a lot of showers and thunderstorms with. They'll be hit or miss, but that is what we get in this pattern. Now, what about El Nino, okay? So what I did, oh, let's look over here on the right first. This particular map takes a look at the correlation for June and July, 500 millibar heights, which means troughs and ridges here, and we're looking at the correlation with El Nino. We normally see ridging in this area, which you just saw, and a trough just off the Aleutian Islands. And what that tends to do with the jet streams allows it to go rather fast in through here and then lift into this area. You can kind of see the higher heights down there. And we kind of see that pattern in the near term. Now take a look over here. This is valid out again on the night of July the 4th. And what do we see? We have a trough in through here and that ridge feature that's right up in that region. And the jet stream is kind of favoring this kind of check mark look to it. See how it's kind of like a backward check mark? And it builds into a bit of a ridge here. And we're seeing that. So this is very much uh, an El Nino type flow pattern. Now, what's going on with El Nino? Well, I'm going to take you first to the map that's over here on the right, this animation, I should say. We're looking at the depth. So over here, we could call this Australia, and over here, this would be South America. And this is the equatorial Pacific on the surface. Now, when you look at this, this is depth, so going down below the ocean surface. We've seen some cooler water begin to emerge, and a lot of our warmer water pooling in the central Pacific here. Can you see that? So that's where we've kind of taken this, this El Nino event right now. Now what about that map over there on the right? This is called the Hovmuller diagram. It's a little bit tricky to see here, but we have date on the y-axis, which is here, and on the x-axis we have longitude. So the heart of the Corn Belt in terms of longitude is right about in here, all right, just to kind of keep perspective on this. So this is primarily the Pacific Ocean, all right? And we've seen these weaker winds move through here and then followed by some stronger winds. And when I say stronger, I'm actually talking about westerly wind bursts uh, in, in, the flow of the, in the flow of the low levels of the atmosphere. Now, if you're sitting here going, Snodgrass, you lost me. What's the point of this? The point of this is to say that with the warming of the water here and the cooler water starting to emerge in this area, what we may be able to see throughout the rest of our, of our kind of, well, the very last day of spring and then summer is a flow pattern that may feature stronger flow like that out of the subtropics. So now we're looking at zonal wind anomalies. Wherever you see the warmer colors, that means faster west to east winds. Wherever you see the bluer colors, that represents slower east to west winds. And this is almost to a T a split pattern that comes into a bit of a ridge like this. Now, if we were seeing this particular pattern and we had planted this crop back in April and May, this would be bringing in some heat, well, some hot and wet conditions more than likely. Uh, but Remember, we got to treat this whole year as if it's an entire month behind at least. But this is at least some support that I'm seeing with the teleconnections in the flow of the jet stream. What about another feature here? We're now going to look at something called the quasi-biennial oscillation. We're going to look at its relationship with the flow of the atmosphere. Now, the QBO right now is very high. So QBO, quasi-biennial oscillation, is, is in its very uh, positive phase. And when it's like that, we tend to get ridging in through here troughing in this area, and the jet stream wanting to do this. So I guess what I'm trying to say right now is these two teleconnections are working together uh, to kind of give us the flow pattern that we're currently seeing. And the question is, how long does that last? Well, as long as we keep the QBO positive and El Nino in its face, we may favor this flow pattern for quite some time. There are some wild cards in there. Currently, the Madden Julian oscillations crash back into null phase, which taken it, it's kind of taken it out of the picture. We'll talk about what happens if that changes in a few minutes. But I'll take you out to the 10th of July now. And what do we see? You can kind of see it just off the page here. There's the trough. Here's the ridge, and the jet stream is doing this, keeping that ridge here. Now, if it does that, remember, we're going to get northwest flow across the Corn Belt, and you can even see it being picked up in the models as this slight wet bias in through here. Now, this region in through here is showing up dry, but I think we're going to still see a lot of thunderstorm activity. Overall, through the 10th of July, though, because that flow pattern is doing this, look at the warmth we have here in and around the Great Lakes states with the cooler bias out west. So that's very consistent with those teleconnection patterns. Again, ENSO, El Nino, uh, and the quasi-biennial oscillation. Let me take you out to the 20th of July. We still see it. See that ridge there, the, the trough over the Aleutian Islands? Fast jet stream doing something like this. Now at this point, the ridge is kind of pushed back a little bit farther to the west. We have pretty well-defined northwest flow. We can't really look at the longer range precipitation anomalies at this point. We're, we're a month out in the forecast here, and it's not going to be able to pick up on these details. But I will show you this. 
I'm, I'm interested in why the models are picking up on the wet bias here up from basically Florida up the East Coast. It could be due to the presence of this trough, but remember the ocean temperatures in through here are warm, and this may be getting into the tropical season here, so we have to be on the lookout for what's going on there. But once that ridge shifts here, you do notice that we don't hang on to our warmer bias. So if we do see a ridge that continually shifts west with time as we get into the month of July, this doesn't bring in the heat we would want. And remember, we need to be treating July as if it was June, and we would want the heat in June. This right now is picking up on a warmer pattern in the northwestern United States up into Alaska, where that ridge is sitting up here, and not so much for the heart of the country in the middle section of the country, I should say, the heartland of the country. So that is less than ideal. Okay, so quick summary before I take you to Europe real fast here at the end. Uh, we're going to have a wet week ahead for the Corn Belt. We talked about that. Week two is drier, but I wrote in here it's not dry. It's just drier than what we've been seeing. Also, the east is going to start to warm up while the west cools down. We are watching, as I highlighted, where that ridge is going to develop here. It seems to push west with time over the mountains. Therefore, my confidence, because of the the weakness in the in, you know in picking up on all these signals here is low beyond week two. What do we need? We need warm and we need wet. Warm and wet for the rest of this season. Just stay warm as long as possible. What are the mod models showing for July? Well, a warm start to the eastern United States. Ridge riders, those are the, on the northwest flow coming over something like that, that's going to be setting up as we get into the mid part of the month. That's going to be a lot of squall lines. And we have no problem at this point feeding these storms with Gulf of Mexico moisture, but also saturated soils putting moisture back into the atmosphere. Remember, treat July as if it's June for most of the Corn Belt. Now, as always, this is just good forecasting practice. What could make them go wrong? Well, if the high latitude blocking, I'm talking about that ridge over Alaska and the trough over the Canadian archipelago, if that changes at all, the whole pattern is out the window. And it could change, okay? Next. Uh, right now, we, if, if the quasi-biennial oscillation and El Nino play smaller roles than I'm thinking they're going to, that means the jet stream goes into a much weaker pattern. Uh, and as a result, we have a whole different scenario to be dealing with here. Uh, if that ridge moves east at all, we're going to get hot and dry in the Corn Belt. It's not forecast to, but what it, basically, what if it does? We'll watch carefully. If the ridge stays west, like we said, then it stays wet and stormy. If the MJO comes out of the null phase where it currently sits, that can change everything. And I'm going to circle this one. Please don't forget that. Right now, we've had very, very little tropical activity, but we're getting into July. That's when things really start to pick up. So we have these wild cards called tropical cyclones that could come in and change everything about a forecast. And just remember, it's summer. It is the least predictable time of year, okay? Now, we need wet and warm. And this is the... Um, Deviation from normal, the growing degree day anomaly since June 1st. In the eastern part of the Corn Belt, look at this. This whole area in here where we grow a lot of corn and soybeans, well, they finally got stuff planted, and the Mother Nature's kept it cloudy, kept it wet, and kept it cool. We've been seeing warmer days up here in the north central plains, but they were delayed in planting as well. So we need the whole thing to just turn red here to catch up. And right now, well, it started off in a way that's unfavorable. We will be seeing that ridge come in. Remember, this is happening. But uh, the thing is, is it doesn't last long enough to really be a big help. To finish up, got one last thing to show you. This is out of uh, Europe. So I, I, there's a lot of discussion right now about what's going on in uh, the, kind of the, the Black Sea region. So just so you can see, the Black Sea is here. I'll draw it on both maps, all right? When you look at the map that's on the left, these are temperature anomalies. We are keeping much of this region north of the Black Sea very warm. In fact, most of Europe very warm as we move into the month of July. What about precipitation? Well, you can actually see this same corridor north of the Black Sea. So part of that's a Russian wheat belt, big section there of Ukraine, picking up on a drier bias as we move forward. So the drier anomalies I've been talking about with the Russian wheat belt looks to be carrying over as we progress forward in the forecast for July. With that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this forecast video. We at Nutrient Ag Solutions hope to look forward to our next long-range forecast coming out midday next week on Wednesday. Hope you have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.